So I titled this morning's message Romans 13, 7, because at the end it says, Give honor to whom honor is due. Now, if you real quick would put Exodus chapter 20, verse 12 up. I wanted to read that, and then we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 6 afterwards. So first we got Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, and it's one of the commandments. It says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So within the Word of God is a commandment from God that tells children that we're supposed to honor our mother and our father. Now I don't know about you, but I got to tell you, I got a bad history of not honoring my mother and my father, right? I mean, so this morning, to be truthful, I'm not going to sit here and try to build moms up and put y'all on a pedestal. And no reason why is not that I don't honor you. It's not that I don't respect you. But if you're anything like me as a dad, you probably look backwards and look more on the times when you didn't feel like you didn't get it right than you look at all the times that you felt like you got it right. So instead of us pretending and acting like we always get it right, and, and you know what we're going to do is we're just going to go through the Word. We're going to talk about some wisdom that moms could probably need to know and to understand that, you know what, we don't look backwards uh, especially before we were believers, we don't look backwards on all of the mistakes that we made and just feel as though it's hopeless and that nothing's ever good going to come out of it because the Word of God says that God uses all things towards good for those that love Him. So no matter how many mistakes we've made in the back in the past, whenever we give our heart to the Lord and we begin to live for God, God can use even the mistakes that we made in the past, even if you feel like, yeah, but I'm not even really a... a, a sir, I, I mean, I'm a mother, yeah, but I mean, my kids are all growing up and now they have kids. Well, good. Guess what? Even the mistakes that you made, God can use that in what I call his spiritual gumbo to do a work in your child, which can ultimately have an effect in the rearing of her children uh, as time goes forward. Amen. So, so we're not going to live in the past. We're not going to live in regret. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to thank God for salvation. We're going to thank God that he made a way, amen, to, to connect us to his presence, to teach us his ways. And that's what we're going to focus on. So we're supposed to honor our mother and father. If you could go to Ephesians 6 verses 1 through 3 real quick. Similar passage, but this is in the New Testament. This is the Apostle Paul. and He's talking about some practical Christian living, right? And he's teaching, he's talking, he's already talked to husbands and wives, and, and he's going to talk to the children now. Now, one of the things that we teach a lot of times in this church before is that, especially with the writings of Paul, is that Paul would oftentimes at the end of his letter discuss practical Christian living. He would say, you know, things like, husbands love your wives, or, or you know, wives submit to your husbands. And we're not going to get into that, what all that really means this morning, because this could be a long, drawn out conversation. But... It says it in the Word of God. And then it also talks about children honoring their mother and their father. Well, I can't do none of that stuff if I don't understand how to walk with God. That's right. And in the beginning of his letters, what he would teach is this, that God had a beautiful plan and that ultimately that plan was manifest in sending his son Jesus. Amen. That's really what the song was about that they sang. Sending his son Jesus, who was without sin, who offered his righteousness, his sinless life on the cross to pay the penalty for sin. Amen. And because he died and had no sin, he paid the penalty for all of man's sin. And because of that, the death, the grave couldn't hold him down. That's why he rose again from the dead. Amen. And whenever man, woman, or child for 2,000 years has heard that gospel message, that's what the word gospel means, good news. Whenever man, woman, or child for the last 2,000 years has heard that good news and taken their free will that God gave them. See, God gave mankind a free will. That he can choose to do with himself whatever he wants. Just like a child can choose to disobey their parents, the people of God can choose to disobey their parents, or the people, the creation of God can choose to disobey God, but there's consequences, right? So whenever a person, though, takes their free will that God gave them and says, you know what, Lord, I'm going to believe according to your will. I'm going to believe that you had this beautiful plan and that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sin. When you believe that now your sin is forgiven and now you're in a new place and now you have access to the grace of God. It's the grace of God that changes you. It's the grace of God that empowers you. It's really important that you know that. The reason why is, is before I get into the Mother's Day stuff, the reason why is, is this, is that if you're going through things in life and you're struggling with things, and you can't get free. Some of you have been plagued with things for a long time in your life. And they keep on recurring. And they keep on haunting you. 
And you've tried everything you know to do. You've tried to exert willpower. You've tried to go to the program. You've tried to go to this meeting, after that meeting, this self-help group, whatever the case. You've tried all kinds of stuff, but yet at the same time, the thing keeps plaguing you. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's only one remedy. There's only one prescription. God sent him. His name is Jesus. He died on the cross. And when you keep your faith in what God has provided, he reciprocates and gives grace. And grace strengthens and empowers. Grace isn't just about, oh, you're forgiven again. And it is that. Thank God for that. But grace is also power from God given by the Holy Spirit to strengthen you and to encourage you. So whatever it is that you're going through, you need to know that God can get you through. Amen. And that's something also important for mamas to know. You need to teach your kids that. Well, I'm going to teach that. It's your job. Hold on a second. It's my job to teach you. Amen. It's your job to also continue to learn. And then it's your job to also take what it is that you learn from the word of God and to impart that into your children. There's a scripture in the book of Genesis where God says, I have known Abraham that he might teach his seed after him to know me. It's a command. God, God planned. He said, I, as I looked upon the earth, I found this man named Abraham and I felt like if I revealed my plan to him, he would teach his children after him my ways and how it is that they are to serve me. Many times we think that just by showing up at church that we're serving God, I'm here to tell you, no, that, that's just part time Christianity, right? That we, we come together to for, not to forsake the, the gathering of the brethren to learn of the word of God. But true Christianity exists seven days a week, 24 seven, where, where the Holy Spirit's dealing with your heart. Amen. Dealing with your life daily, walking it out. Some people are like, well, you know, that's not where I am right now. Well, that's OK. I mean, we believe that the seeds of the gospel will enter into your heart and will begin to take root in you and that without you even realizing it will begin to change you. Amen. 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 You know, there was a time in my life when I didn't really want to uh, want to receive all the truth of the gospel. I just felt like I had some more living to do. We're going to get into what my living looked like because why in the world I wanted to wake up again and feel like that, look like that, I have no idea, but I just thought I was missing out on something. And I got to tell you that it wasn't until I truly surrendered my life to the Lord Amen. That I found the life that I was looking for. All right. So Ephesians chapter six doesn't mean it was perfect, but I found the life I was looking for. Ephesians six, one through three, the apostle Paul now is teaching practical Christian living after he's taught us all that stuff about knowing how to put faith in Christ and to receive grace. And he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. As children, we are to obey our parents. You know, that's really what the passage is speaking specifically to children. So as children, we're supposed to obey our parents. And, you know, there's been times, I know that many parents have used, utilized this parenting technique where they like, explain something to their kid and their kid's like, why? And their parent says, because I said so, right? And so well, you need to obey your parents. I've tried to take a little bit of a different approach. Don't, don't ask me why, sassy, because that ain't gonna work out. But what I would try to do is I would try to explain it to them. You know what I'm saying? This is why I want you to do what I want you to do. You feel you're inquisitive? You need to learn something? Good. Okay, I'll take a little bit of time. I'll instruct you. This is why I want you to do what I want you to do. And, and so do it. And what they were supposed to do is obey me, right? Well, once I'm an adult, I don't necessarily have to obey everything my mama tells me because I got my own life to live now, too. And I got my own things that are going on in my life. But I'm supposed to honor my mother. And my father, amen. I'm supposed to, re, to to treat them with honor. Well, what does it mean? What does the word honor even mean? It means high respect as for worth, merit, or rank to be held in honor. And, you know, sometimes I realize that many times moms or dads, and we even prefaced the message this morning by this, by saying this, didn't always do everything that was right. Lord knows. I mean, mama was a great mom, but she didn't always do everything that was right. And Lord knows, I love my daddy, but he sure enough didn't do everything that was right. And so sometimes it's kind of hard. You know, what am I honoring that, that old bird for? Look how, you remember what he did to me at that baseball game? Honor him. He's lucky. Yeah, I'm going to honor him. Uh, uh, you know, wait till he gets old and he can't swing back. You know, uh, no, I wouldn't do that to him. But um, as a matter of fact, well, that's not important, but even at the end of his life, he still looked like he was too strong to mess with. But anyway, 
one of the things that I, that I, so honor means to elevate, to, to have respect for. And even though they didn't do everything right, one of the things that I realize is, is that they still went through a whole lot of a mess to deal with me. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Do you remember the things that your mama used to actually probably do for you? How she toted you around here and there and did that for you and did this for you. And it's like, I'm thinking to myself, man, my mama did a lot for me. You know, now, once again, maybe not everybody's mama did that for them. And I realize that some people may have a really bitter taste in their mouth towards their mama. But I got good news for you. Even if that happened, there's one name for God in the Bible. It's called El Shaddai. It means the full-breasted one. And that means that he can he be here to nurture you. He can be here to nourish you. Amen. It doesn't mean that God's a woman. But it means that God understands how to nurture and to nourish. And he can provide for you everything that your mama left empty in your life. Amen. So there's always hope with God. Don't ever give up on the Lord. Amen. One quick thing that I wrote down on here was I, I was thinking about the fact that we observe other people's behaviors. Because we're talking about right now just saying we need to honor. Give honor to where honors do. We oftentimes observe other people's behavior. I mean, have you ever noticed that once you tell somebody you're a Christian, how they start to watch you like a hawk? Have you ever noticed that? Oh, they're always looking for something, boy. Like, oh, I thought you were a Christian. And they want to call you out. Well, good. I got good news for you. You don't have to an answer to them. You need to answer to the Holy Spirit that lives in you. And if you did something wrong, the Holy Spirit will deal with you. Amen. But I can assure you, when you start letting people know you're a Christian, they're going to start watching you like a hawk. Well, even more so, have you ever done or said something? Uh, that was probably inappropriate. Maybe you regretted it. And then only to turn and you see your kid looking at you with this crazy, bewildered look on their face like, what in the world did you just do? You know? And uh, so the point to all this was, I just wanted to make was that we want our kids to honor us. And at the same time, many times we behave our lives in such a way, we speak certain things in such a way, we have certain actions, and our kids are observing our behavior towards the way we treat our own parents, and they're thinking to myself, what in the world want to, they think that's normal behavior. This is, this is how my parent acts towards, you know, so why in the world should I act any different? No, our kids observe our behavior. I know that I know that to be the uh, uh, the truth because they're and and and, and also uh, what, like sometimes our siblings like in, in our home I can remember I mean I didn't have this written down but as I'm thinking you know hopefully my sister won't mind me doing this but I'm going to do it you know there was a I became very disrespectful at some point in time in my life. Because, I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you, I had an excuse. I was on drugs and alcohol. I was a mess. And anybody that tried to tell me what they wanted me to do, I wasn't listening. And I just did. I just told whoever I wanted to tell. Well, Cynthia, my sister, she, wasn't, she was young and she wasn't really into all that, at least not at that point in time. And, uh, but at the same time, she learned how to be pretty disrespectful her own self. It was something that took place in the air. She observed how I acted, and she started to act a similar way. And the point that I'm trying to make is, is that people observe other people's behaviors, and many times our children observe the way that we act and respond, and so they think that certain things are okay. But I'm here to tell you that, that you know, that's, it's not okay, and that, that honoring our mother is not just one Sunday that takes place during a year. Right. Honoring our mother is something that takes place throughout the year. I'm preaching to the preacher this morning because it's a commandment and it's a word that is given by God. God said, honor your mother and your father. Our children can easily observe our behavior towards our parents. And, uh, you know, our kids aren't dumb. They figure out things. And so once again, if we're telling them to honor, but yet at the same time, we're not honoring, then they're not going to they're going to do what they observe rather than what they hear. But when it comes to moms, in most cases, you know, one of the things I'll say is that the majority of our time typically is spent with mom. I don't know if that's been the case with you. And I, I know that things are a little bit different nowadays, but just bear with me. Many times dad is off at work doing his thing and mom is left to take care of the daily needs of the kids. And once again, I know nowadays things are different. Sometimes uh, dads change diapers and cook. I know I change diapers and I cook sometimes. Uh, sometimes they bathe the kids. But in most cases, it's good old mom that daily and tirelessly takes care of those things. The truth is that most of the time, we get so used to mom doing her job that we start to take it for granted. But moms deserve honor. Amen. Now that I'm an adult and I'm around kids in the clinic a lot and I see the way that they act. I, I mean, today's society is pretty bad. I mean, kids are out of control, dude. Like, they, they wouldn't act like that in my house. They ain't gonna, nobody will talk to me that way. Excuse me, I got to hydrate. Um, 
I, I, and sometimes I watch how kids are, how they act, and, and how they are so demanding. They're so demanding towards their parents. I want this. I want that. You know, and um, and I think to myself. Uh, more than likely, I was probably maybe similar. I don't know, but uh, they complain and constantly nag. The next thing they want, and for the next thing they want, it makes me wonder: Did I do that? Did I constantly nag my mom? I don't remember being being that demanding as a kid. I mean, I I could be wrong, but I, I don't remember it. I do remember my mom doing a lot for me, though. Um, moms come through for us all the time when we don't even realize it. They're always giving us rides to places like practice and washing our clothes and cooking our food and all these kinds of things that are going on. I remember my mama hauling me all over Lafayette, Louisiana. I want to go hang out with James Morgan before she let me ride my bike over there. And I mean, I was way on the other side of town. Okay, Matthew, I'll bring you over there, you know. And, and she just hauled me all over the place, you know, making sure that I could go hang out with my friends and and, and do whatever, you know. So I just think that moms deserve some honor. And I, don't, I can tell you that I don't feel like I have honored my mom the way that I should in the past. But one of the first things I wanted to point out this morning is that moms listen. I think a good mom listens, all right. Some of this is practical. We're going to get into some scripture here in a second. But I thank God that my mom listened. Uh, I had a couple things that happened to me in my childhood, that, I mean, that, that kind of bothered me pretty bad. And, and I remember that mom, I felt like she was approachable, even as a young kid, didn't really know any better, didn't know why certain things happened the way that they did, but it was something that burdened me, and I felt like I needed to be able to talk to somebody about it, and I felt like mom was a safe place, and no, I couldn't talk to dad about it, but I felt like mom was a safe place, and I can remember talking to her, and I remember her listening, and she came up with the best plan that she could, but the point is, is that she listened. I needed somebody to talk to, she was approachable, and she listened, okay? That was pretty Pretty serious stuff. I mean, if if she wouldn't have been willing to listen, who knows what what, what what would have happened in that situation? On a little bit of a lighter note about listening, though, I was thinking the other day. I didn't wasn't thinking about it in connection to Mother's Day. Don't ask me why I was thinking about it. Maybe because sometimes on cheat day I'll grab some dark chocolate and dip it in peanut butter. But I was thinking about how when I was a kid, how much I liked Reese's peanut butter cups. All right, that was my favorite chocolate candy. I love me some Reese's peanut butter cups. And when we moved to Singapore, I turned 10 over there. Well, you can cry and beg and complain all you want to. It doesn't matter how much you beg, you will not find a Reese's peanut butter cup in Singapore. And I can remember t telling my mom, I want a Reese's peanut butter cup. And I don't know if I threw a fit over it, but uh, all of a sudden, about a week later, mom says, hey, Matt, you want a treat? And I walk over there, and she's got this big old pan, and it's got chocolate on top. And uh, she starts cutting that thing into, into little pieces, and she pulls the first piece out. It doesn't just have chocolate on top. It's got chocolate on bottom. It's got peanut butter in the middle. Wow. Boy, I tell you, so she listened. And, and I never, look, she made that stuff several times before we moved back to the States, and I never once thought about a Reese's peanut butter cup again, maybe, you know. And so there, well, all I'm trying to say is, is that, that she listened. And she responded. She heard what my little heart wanted, and she made me a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> yeah. And I guess that's the first thing that could be said about a good mom. She listens and responds. Mom heard what I wanted, and she responded. I can say that I'm really glad that she listened because Dad just sat in the chair. I can remember before we moved to Singapore. I'm not trying to pick on Daddy. He'd probably giggle if he heard it because he know it would be true. But uh, before we moved to Singapore, I can remember him sitting in that recliner, and he got his, I guess it was Schlitz beer back in the day, you know, and he had the football game on, and I'm over there trying to get his attention. I can remember being a little kid standing there by that recliner. Dad, Dad, Dad. Dad, if I didn't say dad a hundred times, I'm telling you, that dude just stayed glued on the TV. I'm standing right there, and he doesn't hear one word coming out of my mouth. I feel like thinking to myself, dude, do you hear me? Hey, I knew better than to get in front of his face, though, in between the football game. But I'm just glad that mama listened because daddy didn't listen. He just sat there, watched his football game, and took another swig off the Schlitz beer. You know, um... Anyway, yeah, Mom, I'm glad you listened because if not, maybe things would have been really bad. But num that's number one. I just want you to know that, that moms listen. But number two, moms also nourish. Moms take time to listen, but they also nourish. If you go to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, this passage of Scripture is really talking about uh, husbands and wives. But I believe that there's a connection to a parent and a child also. And I'll explain to you why I believe that. 
It says in Ephesians 5, 28 and 29, so ought men to love men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord does the church. So the scriptures really talk about how the way a husband is supposed to love his wife. He's supposed to nourish her and cherish her, right? Because that's how the Lord treats his body, which is which is you and I. The idea behind it is that a man wouldn't treat his own flesh improperly. And when a man and a woman become married, they become one flesh. So if you're not going to treat your own flesh bad, you're not going to cut your hand off. Why would you do that to, to your spouse, right? Uh, at the same time, i got to tell you that our offspring are certainly our flesh. They're, they're, they're a part of who we are. Um, and the idea of nourishing and cherishing, it's kind of interesting when you see it this way. I don't know how this will come across in modern society because of all the women's lib stuff and the feminism that we've experienced. But And I don't know if a lot of times back in these days, uh, men were a lot more mature and maybe even older than the wives that they married. But the idea between nourishing and cherishing is almost like raising them up, bringing them to a level of maturity. So there's something to the relationship between a man and a woman whenever it's a godly relationship that the man can actually help to mature and to nourish and to cause uh, the woman to, to grow up and to become stronger and, and stronger in the faith. But regarding the children, the same thing it happens. So nourishing describes helping them to grow, helping them grow to a place of maturity. The word cherish literally means to brood or to keep warm. Almost like a hen does her chicks, right? So, but seriously, children need more than just calories that nourish their physical bodies. They also require spiritual and emotional nurturing. Now you might say, yeah, but that's not me. I, I don't do that. But I'm here to tell you, Children need that. They need to have a an environment where they're told that it's going to be okay. They need to be built up. They need to be strengthened. They need to be encouraged. Okay. They need they need to be told. They need to have a safe environment in which to grow so that they can that they can be nourished and nurtured. Listen, the opposite is going to produce anxiety and fear. Have you ever tried to operate under a spirit of fear? I just put this thing up in my hallway because every time I turn around where I work, and you can keep it on the tape as far as I'm concerned, everywhere I time I turn around, somebody's stricken by fear. It's always something. Something bad's going to happen. And so I got this thing in the mail from Florence Nightingale for Nurses Week, and it said, how little can be done under the spirit of fear. And I, I put it up there on the on the wall, you know, because, because fear will paralyze you. And a child that grows up in an environment that's full of anxiety and fear, and uncertainty will produce fear and uncertainty will paralyze them will make it incapable of them being able to move along because of the way our society has been for so long the thought is that dad goes to work and makes the money for the family it's not his responsibility to let the kids know that he loves them or to encourage them when they're having a bad day instead that's mom's job i don't believe that I don't believe that's true at all. I've seen that people believe that. My dad, I feel like, kind of believed that. Um, but I believe it's very important that fathers let their children know how much they love them and try to provide a safe environment for them. But many times, that's not what happens. Men, men think that, you know, it's all about as long as I can teach them how to throw a ball, I can teach them how to hit a ball. You know, it's all good. Teach them how to kill a bird or whatever the case. You know, teach a man stuff. No. I don't agree with that, but at the same time, many men do believe that way. So if mom doesn't do what she what, what she needs to do as far as nourishing and cherishing, then they're just not gonna they're not gonna get it at all, right? And is it and if mom's not there to minister to the kids' emotional and spiritual needs, and dad isn't there either, what happens when they do fall? What happens when they do have a bad day, a bad month, a bad year, and there's no one there to nourish them and let them know that this is part of the training process that God uses. In our lives to teach us patience and endurance and steadfastness. You know, it requires right now, as I'm saying all of this, it requires right now for the people in this room to even believe that the Bible is the Word of God. I mean, because there's a lot, there's a possibility. There's some people that showed up this morning and you may not even believe that. I'm here to tell you the Bible is the Word of God, and within the Word of God, there is instruction for God's Amen. people. Amen. Amen. And God's people are supposed to take that Word and that instruction and give it to their children. And repeatedly give it to them. If you go back to Deuteronomy, I'm not going to go there right now, but in chapters 4 and 6, the Word of God said that you're supposed to write God's Word on the post of your house, 
on the frontlet, put it, make a bracelet out of it, put it on the inside of the house, talk about the word of God when you wake up in the morning, when you sit down to eat, when you go down to sleep, because God wanted his people to know his word. Now, I've flipped through the channels before, and I've seen, uh, I remember it was a particular woman, and I think she was a feminist, and it talked about the fact that, um, you know, that, well, parents that cause their children to go to church and make them learn about the Bible or brainwashing them. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. The Word of God says, uh, that talks about the Word of God. That the Word of God washes. Amen? It's like a cleansing action. Because I, I want to make it clear what we're talking about here this morning. There's the world and there's the kingdom of God. The world, according to the scriptures, is under the influence of a spirit. It's called the, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. I'm telling you what the Bible teaches. That the spirit is of an antichrist and is it against everything that God stands for. And that that spirit is driving people to go in a direction that is in opposition to the ways of God. And everything around the children is trying to move them. Listen, it is not an accident. I didn't plan on any of this right now. But it is not an accident that younger and younger, and I'm going to say it. That younger and younger our children are being introduced to the homosexual lifestyle. Yes. Or, okay, you got a problem with homosexuals, what about people that, no, it's not just homosexuality, but it's just basically illicit sexuality. Younger and younger, our children are being exposed to, whether it be on the Barney Show, whether it be on Disney Channel, whether it be in commercials that are taking place, whatever it may be, and, it's, and, and I'm here to tell you, I'm not going to get too crazy on you this morning, I'm going to spare you because some of y'all are guests, I don't think it's an accident. I think it's a purposeful move by whoever they may be in order to infiltrate our lives, our homes, and to move humanity further and further away from God. So what I'm trying to say is, is that you can be Christian parent, devouring your word, doing what God said, write the word of God on the post of your house. Tell them the word of God when they wake up in the morning. You can put sticky notes up on their mirror when they're up in there brushing their teeth. You know, that the scriptures that talk about the things of God. You can hit them with a quote of scripture on the way out the door as you're throwing their bags in the car to bring them to school. You can pick them up and, hey, what was the, what was the memory verse that we learned this morning and try to make them recite it? You can do all of these things. Bring them to children's church. Make them read. But I'm here to tell you the spirit of Antichrist is working against you. He's fighting against you, trying to pull your children away. So to that woman on the TV that said they're trying to brainwash their children, you don't all right on you. Because if she grows up and she begins to believe the way that you believe, she's going to turn her heart away from God and her soul is going to be destroyed. That's not an option in my house. And if she's going to choose to do that, then it's going to be on her. It won't be her. Amen. That her daddy didn't try to teach her the ways of God. Amen. And, and once again, we need to understand that. We can say we go to church, but if we're living our life like the world the other six days, we're not really living for God the way that God intended it to be. The children of Israel live for God each and every day. He was part of their everyday lives. He was part of everything that they did. Amen. It all surrounded his word and, and the decisions that they made and the behaviors that they engaged in. But the point what I'm trying to tell you this morning is what's going to happen if daddy don't listen, if mama's not there, if she doesn't know the word of God in order to instill it to her children, they're having a bad day, a bad month, a bad year. How are they going to know that, you know what? God uses these things in our lives. Because <laughs> see, some people are going to be like, ah, what are you talking about, preacher? God uses, God makes bad things happen in my life to get my attention? Is he trying to punish me? That's not really what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, there's bad stuff that happens on the earth. Yes. Because why? The Bible said it's fallen. The Bible says that when Adam fell, there's a curse. And bad stuff happens. But God doesn't waste it. Amen. God knows what's in our heart more than we know what's in our heart. And he allows things to take place in order to produce trial and tribulation, which means pressing. He presses us. And, 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 you know, even Paris, I was watching some of his sermon when he preached for us the other night, how, uh, you know, and I've mentioned it several times before, but how the Garden of Gethsemane, the word Gethsemane literally means the olive press. Jesus was in the olive press. He was being pressed. That's what the word tribulation means. It means to be pressed. 
the, the things of life as we live as a Christian and our con the things that we do and the way we live that are contrary to the world many times produce trial and tribulation in our life. And sometimes the enemy is just trying to destroy us and trying to destroy our faith. And our kids need to learn from an early age. I can remember having conversations. I didn't plan on getting into all this, but I can remember having conversations. One of the one of the problems that one of my girls had was it seemed like every time she kind of got close to somebody, they would just they would just do her dirty. I mean, just slice her up, you know, whatever. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was mean, hurtful stuff. And I, I mean, I never taught my kids to be that way. I, I mean, not to be mean towards people, you know. Instead, you want to try to encourage people, right? I mean, that's what Christians do. They encourage people. Encourage and strengthen and stand alongside, you know, walk with your brother. If they ask you to go one mile, you go two, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I could tell her little heart was broken. And she went she wasn't very emotional, she wouldn't cry a whole lot, but I just knew I felt so strongly in my spirit that I, I can remember I was sitting at this place that was called Coyote Blues. Is what in Lafayette, right? And uh, so if you ever ate there, if you never ate there, it's pretty good. I guess really good cheese grits. But <laughs> it's a Mexican restaurant and it was pouring down rain and we were sitting in this van and it was me and her and she was just so emotionally distraught because his friend had done whatever, whatever. And I just tried to explain to her. I sat there for 20 minutes and had a conversation with her about the fact that you can expect that this will not be the first time. I mean, it's, it's certainly not going to be the last time. As you go through life, you can expect, now this might sound pessimistic to you, but this is just reality. You can expect people are going to do the wrong thing. Yeah. Even the preacher sometimes is going to do the wrong thing. Your mom is going to do the wrong thing. Your best friend is going to do the wrong thing. And what's going to happen is, is that the enemy is going to try to use that to strike a root of bitterness on the inside of your heart. He's going to try to use that to destroy your spiritual walk. He's going to try to use that to destroy your love for God. You have to be aware of what the enemy's tactics are. Right. He's going to try to cause hate to enter your heart. He's going to try to cause you to turn away from the things of God. This is part of the process that God allows to happen in the lives of his children in order to teach them how to become dependent upon him. Amen? Because there's coming a day whenever she may not, she's not going to live in the house forever. And she's going to find and she's going to experience things in her life on her own. And if she doesn't learn how to access the grace of God through faith in Christ, she's going to learn how to numb the pain another way. She's going to learn how, like the countless millions in our society today, to just make the pain go away. And what I'm here to tell you is that's not the answer. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. I'm not trying to pick on nobody. I'm not trying to say, but antidepressants aren't the answer. Mm -hmm. Xanax ain't the answer, mm -hmm. right? A anxiety medicine, it's not. Mm -hmm. Drinking ain't the answer, that's for sure. Uh, another, another relationship to trying to numb the pain. And that's not the answer. No, Jesus is the answer. That's right. And the grace that he gives to heal and to strengthen and to encourage is the answer. Is it always going to be a sunshiny day? No. Are you going to have some bad times? Yes. Are you going to feel pain? Yes. Are you going to cry sometimes? Well, i got to tell you, I do. And guess what? But at the same time, God's still on the throne. Amen? And as you go through life and you hold on to Him and you look to Him, He will strengthen you. Amen? He will encourage you. Sometimes trial and tribulation gets you right where you need to be. The pressures of life get you right where you need to be because it causes your face to focus on Him. Now, my point is, is that if mama ain't there to tell you, who in the world will? Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Who's going to tell you these kinds of things? That's why you got to go home, Mom, and you got to read and you got to learn. Amen? I mean, if you need me to come meet with the, with the kids, we can talk about it together. We can. And I mean that. But at the same time, it's going to do a whole lot better if you know it for yourself. Amen? Because the people of God know the Word of God. Amen? And don't get me wrong, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. It's a lifelong process. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what does that even mean? See, first off, a kid needs to know that they've been justified by faith. What does that mean? It means that Jesus died, and when you put your faith in that, you're no longer guilty in the eyes of God. They need to know that. It's faith in Christ that causes them to no longer be guilty. You don't have to walk around with that cloud of guilt on your back, son. Daughter, you don't have to walk around that way. God, Jesus died so that that cloud of condemnation could be removed off your back. Now stand up straight. Amen. Lift your chin up a little bit. And keep on walking with the Lord. 
Yeah. It says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace where we stand. That's the only thing that's going to help you stand. You can try to lean up against the wall. You can try, you can try to, to take this, take that, but that, that's not going to help you stand. No, grace. The supernatural working and power of the Holy Spirit in your life is what's going to help you to stand even in the hard times, even whenever times are their worst. And sometimes you feel like you're going to give up. Amen. I think I quoted that footprints in the sand a while back where the old boy said that, you know, that there were these two sets of footprints. And but then he turns around, and he says, you know, Lord, I was happy that you walked with me through life. But during the worst times of my life. There's only one set of footprints. Where were you, Lord? Why'd you leave me? He said, I didn't leave you. I can hear the Lord telling you, you silly goose. I didn't leave you. I was carrying you in those times. Yeah. There's times in our life when things are so bad, so hard, that we can't even function on it. The Lord got to just pick us up and carry us through it. Amen? Yeah. The kids need to know that where there is proper faith will produce grace. Grace will help you to stand. Amen? Yeah. It will help you to stand in the worst of times. I'm here to tell you this morning. Amen. Even if you're not a mama, you need to know grace will help you Amen. to stand. Amen. He goes on, Paul says, but we glory in tribulations. We glory in the press. Whenever we find ourselves being pressed, well, that's easy for you to say, Paul. Well, I don't know why it would be easy for Paul to say. I mean, he was only stoned and, and left for dead and shipwrecked twice and left in the water and whipped and beaten with rods. But if what he said, tribulation produces some things in your life. See, you know, I didn't write this down, but I think it's important for moms to know that too, this little aspect. Don't try to rescue your kids from every single little thing. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I know she didn't. I know she didn't talk to my baby that way. Oh, it's about to go down. Hold on. You know what? Hold on a second. It's time. You ain't got to protect them so much that, you know, come on, man. A little bit of... Roughing up every now and then ain't going to kill nobody. As long as you're teaching them how to access grace. You can't fix every single thing. Right? Amen. So, But it produces some things in your life. It produces. So tribulation and learning how to keep your eyes on the Lord will help to produce endurance. How many times whenever things get tough, people want to quit? You know what I'm talking about? You see some people, they go through life and they just keep on quitting. I ain't picking on nobody, I'm just telling you. Every time it gets rough, they quit. But guess what? You can't just quit. Yeah. And I'm so proud of my daughter right now. I know it's not just about talking about my daughter. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm so proud of her right now. She probably have a fit if she knew it. But the last couple of semesters in school, man, she's been taking some classes, dude, that I, like, they're a lot harder than anything I ever took. But the crazy thing is, is that she gets to a point in the class where it's like she made some rough, because she didn't understand it. It's like, kept, Organic chemistry too, and physics too, right? Dude, don't even say those words around here. But she got to some points where she didn't, she just didn't understand it. And she made some low grades. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, I'm over there wringing my hands, like, oh my God, I'm asking her every day, did you get to go to tutoring, whatever? And two semesters in a row, bam, she sticks it in there to the very end and she pulls it out. And I'm just thinking to myself, well, praise God, she ain't a quitter, amen. And she's learning how to endure. And I know that's a life situation. But sometimes, even whenever it comes to sports, I've tried to tell Isabella that before. You know, she played softball, and she learned a, she had a lot of frustrations while she was playing softball. A lot of different things that happened. And, and I use it as a learning opportunity. Baby, you think life is about softball? Dude, softball is so insignificant in your life. Softball is like a little microcosm of the big picture. See, that's one of the things that I learned after I gave my heart to Jesus. The football coach always used to say, Matt, you need, to, you need to run as hard as you can. You need to practice as hard as you can. You need to hit as hard as you can in the practice so that when you get in the game, you're going to play like you practice, right? And Dad would put so much emphasis on football. That's the one time he talked to me. Oh, let's talk about football. Get in there. Hit him as hard as you can. All this kind of stuff. And, I, and dude, I loved it. You know, I'd get in there. I'd work hard and try to do all this stuff. And then when it's all said and done, I realized, you know what? Football kind of like life a little bit. Football's a little bit like walking with the Lord. There's times whenever things get tough. There's times whenever things get rough. But you can't just drag up and quit. You can't roll off the side of the football field and quit. No, you got to stick it out. You got to stay in there. You got to keep on hitting even though you're hurting. Even though the guy across the line from you might be stronger than you and bigger than you know and all that kind. You can't quit. And it's the same thing with walking with the Lord. When you find yourself in pressure situations, trials and tribulations, you can't just quit and drag up on God. You got to keep walking with the Lord. Amen. And if mama's not there to tell the child that, who will be 
to tell the child that. And when it's all said and done, what that passage says is that it ends up producing not just endurance, because that word patience really means endurance, but if you go to the next, uh, next verse, patience, experience, it produces character. That word experience really in the Greek means character. It's, pro it's forming you. It's producing character in you. And not only, but it also character produces hope. Because you see, as you see God changing you, as you see God changing you on the inside of the Mr. Trolley, got you through that one. Oh, man, I didn't think I'd ever get through that one. Oh, my goodness, it was so painful. It hurt so bad. But he got you through. He's faithful. Amen. And when it's all said and done, you got, it produced something in you that you didn't realize it was going to produce. It gives you hope. Yeah. It gives you hope that God's real. It gives you hope that his word's real. It gives you hope that his ways work. Amen. Amen. And if you can teach that to your children at a young age, amen, it'll give them hope to serve the Lord even whenever times uh, uh, are hard. Amen. So moms listen, moms nourish, but moms also work hard. Can you go to Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 through uh, 31? Now, I kind of, uh, I kind of hesitated on even reading about this old girl because I'm just thinking, man, this woman right here, she got me feeling bad. I mean, I thought I was busy. I thought I was trying to be productive. This woman, she's something. And so, you know, I'm not reading this to make us all feel bad about ourselves that we're never doing enough, but I just wanted to mention that moms work hard. It says in verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts in her so that she shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Uh, she seeks wool and flax and works willingly with her hands. So I want you to see she's getting some raw materials here. All right, we're going to keep moving. She gets raw materials. She works with her hands. She, she is like the merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is yet night and gives meat to her household and a portion to her maids. It gets up long before the crack, crack of dawn, and she's cooking food. She's fixing food. Um, and she considers a field and buy it. She's a businesswoman. She's over there, like there's a good little piece of property right here. I think I'll purchase this. And then it says, with the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. So not only does she buy, buy the land, but she, she, she plants a vineyard in there. She girds her loin with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good. Her candle goes out, not goes not out by night. So she gets up early in the morning and the candle's burning through the night because she got constant work going on and she's accomplishing things. She lays her hand to the spindle. She doesn't only go buy raw materials flax and wool. Now she's got a loom in the house and she's actually making thread out of this stuff. All right. She stretches out her hand to the poor and she reaches forth her hands to the needy. Even as busy as she is, she doesn't forget that there's people less fortunate than her and she's a giver. Amen. She doesn't take from people. It says she's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. Not only does she buy raw materials and not only does she make thread out of it, but she made clothing out of it. And then in addition to that, she actually dyed it because it was expensive to get this scarlet color. She's not worried about the snow outside because all of her family's all snuggled up in the wool that she's actually made all this clothes out of. It says she makes herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. So she got everybody warm in the house, but she also cares about the way that she looks. Her husband is known in the gates when she sits among when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes fine linen and she sells it. She not only is she making the linen, but she's turning around and selling it and delivers girdles or it's another word for parts of types of clothing unto the merchant. She's not only making clothes for the people in her house, but she's selling the overflow that she's making while she's over there with the candle burning to the merchants. And she's making money, which I guess allowed her to buy the field where she planted the vineyard. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looks well to the ways of her household and eats not the bread of idleness. Her children will rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but you excel them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. And so as I was looking at that particular passage of scripture, I started to think to myself, really the main thing I got out of there was that, man, this, this woman is so 
she worked so hard, right? And, I, and, and, and she, she's accomplishing so much. But the main point that I wanted to make what, through it was is that moms work hard. Uh, that was really the main point. Now, I, 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 granted, this woman's unbelievable, the things that she's doing. Um, and I don't think, I don't even want to try to live up to as busy as she is. But what I will say is, is that moms work hard. A woman doesn't have to be buying and selling land and making her own material and then sewing clothes for her kids and for the people. In, but, you know, and have extra to sell to the merchants. A mom that stays at home, sometimes a mom that stays at home can be more busy than a man that works eight to five. As a matter of fact, they probably are. That's right. I believe that. I mean, I've seen that. Troy's like, I can give you a what what on that preacher because I had to do it for some time there. You know? And um, so I know for a fact that women who even stay at home are very, very busy. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a second. But what stood out to me above all else is two statements that were made about this woman. Proverbs 31, verses 26 and 27 says, She opens her mouth with wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. This verse describes the fact that this mom is full of the wisdom of God. And she has enough wisdom to know that there is power in her tongue. She uses her tongue to speak kindness, not harsh, demeaning, derogatory words that tear people down. Instead, what she's doing is she's speaking mercy. She's speaking love. She's speaking hope. If you want your kid walking around like this instead of with their chest up and their chin up and being able to be confident in the things of God, then, and you would prefer that they walk around like this for the rest of their life feeling unworthy, then just go on. Go ahead and keep beating them up with, with words. Well, I've I, I got to be honest with you. You're taking a 50-50 chance. Either, number one, it can do the opposite and cause them to say, well, I ain't going to be what he says I'm going to be, and, you know, and then they get stronger. Or... It'll do, it'll do what I'm saying it's going to do, and it's going to beat them down and cause them to keep looking at the ground. And you just, you have to know your own kid. I mean, I'm not, I don't know why I want to say this, but I mean, you know, when we played football, and even when you're coaching, and even with my nurses, there's some, the, the nurses that work for me, there's some, and the people that put patients in for me, some, some of them I mess with them. I'm like, dude, can you move a little quicker? But I know, they know I'm messing with them. And it actually, it, it, and you know, we talk about it later. It's like, you know, I'm just mad. They're like, oh, no, I know, because they're actually fast, really. And so by me saying that, it kind of like, it keeps a competitive edge in the clinic, and they know that I'm messing with them because I'm real nice to them, too. But then there's other ones I ain't about to say that to. <laughs> if I said that to them, it'd like destroy their whole day, you know? And so you got to learn who can handle what and how you can talk to certain people, right? And I mean, I haven't become the master of it, but I'm getting a whole lot better at it. Uh, and so anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that this mom, she opens her mouth and wisdom floods out. She knows that, the pow that the, there's power in the tongue and the things that we say. As a matter of fact, James chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, talks about the power of the tongue. It says, but the tongue, James chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith we curse men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Basically, what the scripture is trying to tell us is that the tongue is a very powerful instrument. It can speak life or it can speak death. And <clears throat> that a uh, fig tree is not going to produce oranges. It just doesn't happen that way. And so it reminds me of, of Romans 12 too. I'm not asking you all to go there, but we preached about it recently. And what we talked about was don't be conformed by the world, but be transformed by, by, by the renewing of your mind. And that the idea of transformed is the same word as transfigured. In the Greek, it's metamorphosis, where we get the word metamorphosis, meaning something that was on the inside of that butterfly came out. In his DNA, it wasn't really a worm, he was a butterfly. Mm -hmm. On the inside of who you are when you get saved, there's something different now. It's God, the Spirit of God. God. Therefore, your tongue mm -hmm. ought to sound more like the Lord than it does the devil, right? And so that, that's really the idea behind it, is that the tongue, the mouth can be a weapon, but in reality, what's supposed to happen is, is that it's supposed to speak life. The point to be understood is that part of the hard work of a mom surrounds how they speak to their children. Words of wisdom, words that nourish and mature will help to produce confident, godly seed, 
Whereas there is a weapon in her mouth, an unruly tongue that day after day and year after year can produce a lot of pain and a lot of harm. The other thing that stood out to me was Proverbs 31 30, where it says, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. The word favor is deceitful. The word favor there really means acceptance. Women back then were dealing with the same thing that some women today do. Everybody's worried about being part of a social network. Everybody's worried about how they're viewed. I say everybody. A lot of people are worried about how they're viewed by their peers around them. And what, what Solomon said is that acceptance or trying to find favor in other people's eyes is deceitful. It'll deceive you. You spend all your time, all your effort, all your work trying to be accepted by other people. It's sad to say, but the reality is, is a lot of times they're probably talking behind you, behind your back anyway. I don't remember what that, what was the name of that movie with those African-American women, The, the Help? Did y'all ever see that movie? <laughs> that poor girl that kept having those miscarriages. If you saw that movie, you know what I'm talking about. That was a good movie. I liked it. <laughs> I don't know, I'm thinking about that. Then Brown is that girl made. But yeah, anyway, that's another story. Um, that poor blonde-headed woman was trying to get the acceptance of them people so hard, so much. And no matter what she did, you know, they wouldn't accept it. They were talking so bad about it behind her back. And it's just a sad thing to know that so oftentimes we're so worried about what people think around us. We spend and exert energy to try to be acceptable in their eyes. And the point that Solomon's saying is that stuff is that acceptance is deceitful and beauty is vain. I mean, look, she that, that woman there, she was actually, she had on purple and silk and she looked good, okay? But if you spend all your time, you can spend all your time in the gym, you can spend all your time putting your makeup on and all that kind of stuff like that, but when it's all said and done, the truth is beauty is emptiness. It's not going to result in anything, but a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. A woman that serves God and takes the wisdom that's in her heart and that comes out of her mouth can speak life into her children and can change generations to come. She speaks to her children and guess what? With time, it changes her children. But not only does it change her children, it changes her children's children because the legacy by the grace of God continues on. Amen? The Proverbs woman is a godly woman. Uh, and and she, she takes those godly words and she gives them to her children. All right, ver number four. So that number three was a woman, work, a mom works hard. Number four is even though they work hard, they don't neglect the most important thing. Let's go to Acts chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. See, in today's society, I was thinking about nowadays, mamas work. And I mean, they're really busy. But even though a good Christian mom, even though she's busy, she won't neglect the most important thing. Acts 16, 12 through 15. It says, and from there to Philippi. It's talking about the Apostle Paul. He was on a missionary journey. He left one destination. He shows up in Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days, and on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spoke unto the women which resorted there. What he's saying is, is that it was the Sabbath day, and we had heard through the local community that there was a riverside area where some women would go over there to pray on the Sabbath. So we said, hey, let's go talk to them. Um, and so it says a certain woman named Lydia... I always like this story because the name of the street that the church is on is Lydia. A seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. Now, what you need to understand, it says she worshiped God. What that means is she's not a Christian yet. She's not even a Jew. She's a Gentile that heard about the God of the Jews, and she wants to live for him, and she worships him. And so all of these women are serving the God of Judaism, but they're going out to the river on the Sabbath because they don't want to neglect the commandment that says, amen, to not neglect the Sabbath. And so they're going out there and then they're praying. But the Apostle Paul's like, that's a perfect opportunity. There are people that already love the Lord. We need to go over there and we need to explain to them more precisely the gospel and about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says, her, she, she heard us. She gave her ear to them to speak. Whose heart the Lord opened. When she heard us, the Lord opened up her heart 
And, and it says right here that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us, which means she basically forced, she told, no, you got to stay, right? Moms work hard and so many times they work so hard that they don't have time for much else. In this story of Lydia, it's just a quick word about some woman, obscure woman. But guess what? Her name has been read for 2,000 years. Her name has been preached for 2,000 years. She's Lydia. We know her as the seller of purple. If you've done any kind of research on the Bible, what you learn is, is that purple was a very, it was talking about the stain that they would use to stain clothing. It came from the murex shellfish, and it was very difficult to harvest enough of this ink that came out of this shellfish in order to dye large amounts of material. It was a very expensive thing. It was a very rare commodity. She was a seller of it. This is, a, this is like the Proverbs 31 woman. She's over here dealing in business, dealing in trade, and she's got this business where she sells purple material, which is a very expensive commodity. But even as busy as she is, as a businesswoman, she doesn't neglect the things that are most important. A couple of things that I noticed about her is, number one, she was a worshiper of God. Once again, she wasn't a Jew. She was a Gentile, but she felt like it was very important to spend time in the presence of God. Number two, she was faithful to spiritual things. Even though she was a businesswoman, she made sure she went to church on the Sabbath because she was faithful to the things of God. She was positioned in the right place at the right time, and it affected her whole family. Amen. She didn't listen to me. I'm not. It's not just about going to church. Okay, you can serve God from your house. You can, but the Bible says not to forsake the gathering of the brethren. There are things that are instrumental in the Word of God and instrumental and integral in the life of the Christian. And if you look at church as though it's a law, oh, i got to go to church again. I hope I don't preach so boring sometimes yes. that that's how you feel. Uh, you know, but, and if I do, Lord, forgive me. Help me. Give me a little pep in my step. Give me a good, better word for the people, right? Because I don't want you bored to death. Amen? But get, and so if you're looking at it like it's a law, then, then you know, that, that's not going to do you any good. You just stay at the house. But it's the things of God. You're concerning yourself about the things of God. And when you do that, you put yourself and your family in a position to receive a blessing from God. It affected her whole family. She received the word of God. And through that, she influenced her whole family to get saved that day. They all got baptized, amen, in Christ. And they all learned about the gospel. The main point I wanted to make with Liddy is that even though she was a businesswoman and probably very busy, she didn't neglect what was most important, the truth and her relationship with God. This is number five, and I'm closing. All right? Moms, stay by your side, even in the bad times. John chapter 19, verse 25 through 27. <coughs> it says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then says he to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. The main point I wanted to make with this is this, is that at the most painful time in Jesus' life, his mom was right there with him. Now, I understand. Jesus is an exception to the rule when it comes to sons, right? I mean, you couldn't ask for a better son, right? But what I want you to know, the point to be made is that a good mom supports your kids. I'm not saying that we agree with them in everything that they do. You know, one thing that I can tell you that I can remember from my, about my mom from an early age was she didn't, she didn't believe. You know, I think I was a pretty good kid. At least that's what she told me. I mean, before, before things got twisted off, I was good. I made up for it later, but I was a pretty good kid. She'd tell me I'd be playing down the road, and I'd come out, run all the way home and say, Mama said another cuss word. <laughs> and she's like, and she's like, oh, Matthew, you need to quit doing that. And I'd run down the road, start playing again. I'd come back down. I, I said another cuss word, Mama. I don't, I don't know what to do. I did it again. You know, kind of hard when you hear an old daddy talking. Well, I don't want to read, right? But anyway, that's another story. But, but I can remember that... It was one time, I swear I you remember specific things. I remember we were in Singapore one time, and we were sitting at the table, and there was an English woman in the house, from somebody from Britain. And she was talking about her children, 
And whatever the case, and I can remember when she walked out, I remember mom probably was frustrated. She said, that woman, some people, they think their kids can't never do anything wrong. <laughs> you know, they just think that they, that they never do any wrong. She said, and, and you know, what I got from that, though, was is that mom realized that, guess what? All kids can do some wrong. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that they're not. So I'm not trying to say that we, we look at our children as though they can never make a mistake. Give me a break. I hate to say it. A lot of times I want the opposite way with my kids. I'm like, you don't have to prove me that you're innocent. You know, uh, you're guilty until proven innocent, which I'll probably handle that the wrong way. But, <laughs> but, the, but the point is, is this is that we stand by our kids, amen? And uh, I don't think it's easy being a good mom. So many times there are stressors in life that weigh us all down, negative things going on in the relationship with the spouse, nowadays negative things going on at work, juggling work, feeding the kids, getting them where they need to go, making sure that they have the right clothes on in the winter and doing all this while speaking good words of encouragement. I don't think it was easy then and I don't think it's easy now, but the main point that I wanted to make is, is that there's certain attributes about a mom that she can only provide for her kids with the grace of God working in her life. Right. So I want to, because I know it's not easy, real quick, I'm going to close, but I'm going to say a prayer for the moms.